So physics is a frontier science. It sits at the very boundary and limits of a particular, a particular type of human inquiry, one that concerns itself with the origins of existence and everything that it contains, our universe, for example. And as a frontier science and a human endeavor, it is an enterprise. And there are many different types of characters involved in this enterprise. And as a way for me to introduce them to you, I'm going to invoke a metaphor for the search, for our search for the ultimate physical truth, as it were. Um, and the metaphor involves a landscape. So the idea is, we're in a landscape, we're surrounded by mountains, separated by valleys, obscured by fog. And we're trying to find the highest summit. So it's a particular type of character that the physicist and author Lee Smolin identified as a summit seeker or a mountaineer. Someone that is immediately next to a tall mountain and decides, right, I'm going to go up. Um, there's also a particular type of character known as a valley crosser or an explorer who thinks to themselves, well, there's a very tall mountain next to me, but perhaps three valleys over, I can't really see what's over there. Maybe there's an even taller mountain. So I'm going to go cross into the unknown. There are entrepreneurs. There are characters who have an appetite for risk, who can inspire and drum up people to go along with them on any particular adventure. There are poets. These characters don't care where they end up. They just enjoy the art and the craft for its own sake. There are literary critics. There are people who have strong opinions about the way things are going, about the state of the art, and seek to influence other people's opinions. There are craftsmen and craftswomen. People who are so talented at a very particular aspect of this enterprise that watching them do their thing becomes a thing unto itself, an art form unto itself. There are engineers who get a kick out of solving problems with a minimal set of resources in the cleverest way possible. And like in any field, there are also politicians. And the less we speak about them, the better. And uh, if I were to identify uh, myself, uh, in, in one of these, I would say that I aspire towards being something in between a craftsman and a valley crosser. Although in practice, my valley crossing has been to the, uh, almost reckless, that uh, it's not been particularly good for my career, although I survived and I'm here to tell you the tale. So how does one practically even go about this enterprise of discovery? So let's begin with valley crossing. And in particular, let's begin with an extreme version of it, which is you go across several valleys and you find something really remarkable that really shatters people's view of how things ought to be done and really redefines a new, a new paradigm. Um, and the way you go about that is very simple. Be a genius or be very lucky. Um, now, I don't mean you to take that too literally. I think genius is a myth that's often created after the fact. Uh, a legend that is rewritten after the fact. But nevertheless, it is true that in almost everything we do, uh, we are the, be the beneficiaries of these various remarkable flashes of insight that have now allowed us to take effortless shortcuts through whatever it is that we're doing. So one that is particularly relevant today is Einstein realizing that gravity is set apart as a force from all the other forces in nature. Because what gravity really is, isn't, well, it is a force, but the way it acts is rather remarkable. Einstein realized that space-time wasn't this arena, this static arena in which things just sort of happen. Einstein realized that, in fact, space-time itself is a thing. It's an elastic medium, and it gets distorted by material objects. So if this apple were the sun, the sun is distorting the fabric of space-time around it, such that if anything is trying to move in a straight line, which it ordinarily would do effortlessly, it might sort of take a curved path. It might even get trapped in a circle going round and round the sun, like the Earth. And this example is particularly relevant today because uh, at this very moment, in fact, um, um, uh, completely at this very moment, there is a press conference happening in Washington, D.C., where the LIGO collaboration is most likely going to announce the discovery of ripples in this fabric of space-time, gravitational waves. So it's a very historic day for physics. Um, and I consider this insight to be one of the greatest leaps a human mind has ever made. And then, um, perhaps on a more practical level, on a day-to-day, -day, we're not, no one's, you know, going about making a revolution happen every day. In fact, it's not always the context for something like that to happen. So on a day-to-day -day basis, in the day-to-day -day process of summit seeking, the sort of, the, the more sort of practical thing of trying to solve problems, to discover new things, 
within an existing paradigm. It's not that everything happens in a vacuum. Everything that we do, whether it's implicitly acknowledged or explicitly acknowledged, borrows from these flashes of insight. We live, we stand on the shoulders of giants, as Newton himself uh, prefaced in his, in his uh, Principia Mathematica. So if you were to step back and ask what the meta process of this would be, if somehow there were a manual of discovery, it would contain the entries of all of the people that have gone before. Einstein would have come along and written something, Descartes would have come along and written something, and Newton would have come along and written something, Darwin would have come along and written something, and whether we acknowledge it or we don't, uh, we are the beneficiaries of this, uh, of this learned metalogic. And if this thing were actually a book, its title would be called Heuristics, or The Art of Invention. And instead of staring at each new problem like it were a blank page, you could instead begin by asking yourself what is essential about the problem. What can be ignored about the problem? What is, what is, what is superfluous detail? Uh, does this look like another easier problem? And could you solve that simpler problem? So I want you to pay attention to this because this is actually the, 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 the sort of the meta process that the scientific method actually invokes. Um, are you looking at the problem the right way? Maybe it's not even a problem. Maybe the bug is a feature. Are you trying too hard? Perhaps you've been working on something for years and years and years, and maybe that's telling you something. Has that problem already been solved? And I think this is something that a lot of people can, can understand, because um, it's, it's often the case that people look to nature for inspiration for certain problems in design. And I think the most dramatic example of that is something that probably brought a lot of you here, which is when the Wright brothers realized that in trying to make this airplane object they're trying to invent fly, they needed to borrow a design that they saw from bird's wings. That problem had already been solved by nature. So the scientific method was perfected in the crucible of natural science, and physics in particular. And uh, an old professor of mine once told me that a good theoretical physicist is intrinsically a lazy person. And uh, so these heuristics of ignoring superfluous detail, simplifying the problem to its barest essentials, maybe make, even making a caricature out of it, solving that simpler problem, and if you can't solve that simpler problem, solve an even simpler problem. This actually works in physics because the universe is intrinsically a lazy place. Structures that we see in one particular context, in one particular scale, are, repro are reproduced across vastly different contexts and vastly different scales. And this is telling us something, that the universe prefers, it has this penchant for this underlying simplicity and economy of description. If you like, the universe outsources the mechanics of its existence to a very small set of universality classes of phenomenon. And uh, none is so dramatic, I think, than the following fact, that if you take any system close enough to equilibrium, and by equilibrium, I mean if you just leave it there, it stays that way forever. It's ground state. It's lowest energy configuration. Any system close enough to equilibrium can be described, once you really break down the way you describe it in terms of mathematics, as a collection of interacting simple harmonic oscillators, like springs. This is just something that is. The collective motion of which look like waves. So by this, I mean networks of neurons in your visual cortex trying to understand or process an image, flocks of birds, crystals, traffic flow. All of this looks, can be boiled down to the same identical mathematics. It's a remarkable fact. Waves on water are a very visceral example of this. We all see this, right? So water is a thing. It exists. And little tiny disturbances on water are waves. These are very nonlinear waves, but if you imagine they were small enough, they'd be quite linear. And these localized excitations carry energy around. What if I told you that fundamental particle physics is nothing more than that? That particles are like waves, localized excitations on an underlying quantum field. So there's this thing called the electron field, and electrons are localized excitations, just like waves on, on the ocean floating around, bouncing off of each other. So are quarks. Quarks are excitations of a fundamental quark field. 
photons, gluons, all the fundamental particles you can imagine are described by the same underlying mathematics. And if you took this to its logical extreme, almost absurd extreme, if you will, uh, there's a theory, a candidate theory for the universe called string theory, which states that there aren't these separate fields. There's only one field, the string field. And its localized excitations are one-dimensional extended objects, strings, whose different notes are the different particles that we see, and whose fundamental note is, the, is, an actually, is actually just a distortion of space-time itself. And alternating the next highest notes are different force carriers and different charged particles. So it's a, it's a really, so physicists make fun of themselves when they realize this. Uh, and they say that physics f is that of all human experience that can be boiled down to study of simple harmonic oscillators. That's it. Um, so we're not very clever. Um, so let's say uh, there is something that we cannot explain. Um, there is a, within the working heuristics of a practicing physicist, there's a particular type of, of paid adventure, a funded adventure, if you like, uh, that I, I just find remarkable, and it's called phenomenology. Um, and uh, it's, to me, it's a remarkable thing. It's a very humbling thing that myself and my colleagues are paid by your taxes to go forth and do this for a living, which is that if we go around and we see something that we cannot explain in the universe, galaxies moving in a way that they, there seems to be some missing matter, for example, you are entitled to break the laws of physics or bend them in any convenient way such that you end up explaining what you see. Let's invent a particle and call it dark matter, for example. Um, and um, in order to give you a concrete example of this, uh, another concrete example of this, I first need to teach you a little bit about uh, quantum mechanics in a slide, if it's possible, so bear with me. So the quantum mechanical, I, I apologize for the equation, I promise I'll explain it. Um, the quantum mechanical universe is a very strange universe. Our day-to-day -day intuition about our relationships with space and time are very different. Measuring where something is and how fast it is going are not commuting operations, okay? So either you're looking at me on the stage or you're staring at your computer screen or your iPhone or whatever it is, but you're looking at something, and in doing that, let's say you're looking at me, you are identifying where I am, I'm standing right here, and how fast I'm going, I'm standing still. But I could have done that operation in reverse. I could have first looked at how fast I was going, maybe with a speed gun or something, and then said, and then to tried to figure out where I was. And ordinarily, you'd think that the order of those two operations shouldn't matter. Uh, and intuitively, at the scale at which we exist, they don't. But in the quantum mechanical universe, that is not true. The order of operation matters, which is telling us something very remarkable, that measuring where something is and how fast it's going cannot be described by numbers, because numbers commute. You multiply them in a particular order, you switch the order, you get the same thing. So the fact that they don't commute means that their difference is not zero, and so they're no longer described by the usual numbers. Uh, and in fact, they're described by these complicated things called operators that we don't need to get into them. And this irreducible uncertainty in determining where and when something is is set by this thing called the quantum. So what that's telling you is that it's impossible to actually localize something. Because if you could, you'd be able to make the statement, I know somebody is there and they're not going anywhere, in contradiction to the laws of quantum mechanics. So that leads to all sorts of strangeness. Particles act like waves. Waves act like particles. And in reality, they're neither. Um, what's, what's, what's happening is our, our, we are monkeys with brains. We've evolved the perception of the world around us because that was what just happened through evolutionary necessity. But at the very fundamental scale, the universe doesn't agree with our monkey with brain concepts, and they completely break down. Things can exist in a superposition of quantum states. Cats can be both dead and or alive. So the very grammar and our Boolean logic of, of ordinary intuition completely fails. Um, so quantum mechanical universe is a very strange one, but we understand it through mathematics, but we are very bad at explaining it through our language. This is one of the many ways in which language is limiting our understanding of the universe. Um, so now, um, it turns out that uh, when we try to make uh, gravity fit with our quantum mechanical description of particles as little waves floating around. There are all sorts of infinities that we don't know how to deal with in our calculations. And so the reason for those infinities is, in fact, that space-time is infinitely divisible. So that means between here and here, there's always a point in between. And no matter how small or how short a distance I look, there's always a point in between. 
And that causes problems in our equations. So a phenomenological thing to do would be, how about we fix that? How about we break that? And then see what happens. Shoot first, ask later. So what if space-time itself satisfied a version of the uncertainty principle? So imagine between us there is an imaginary plane. And I'm pointing to a point right here, this point right here. So how do I know to tell you that this point is here? I would first have to tell you how far along the x-axis, if you allow me to tell you that this direction is x, it is, and how far up it is, right? So the point here is this much along the x-direction, this much along the y-direction. But it also is this much up along the y-direction and this much along the x-direction. That's our usual geometry. But if we take the lesson from quantum mechanics and say, what if space-time itself is intrinsically quantum? What if that operation did not commute? and you'd end up in a different place. That means the idea of a point is meaningless. It is a fiction that you've created because you're a monkey with a brain at a large, large scale. Whereas, in fundamentally, points don't exist. And uh, this geometrical structure has broken many of the rules of mathematics. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of mathematicians that would have been very upset at this until they figured out how to deal with it. And so if you were to imagine what space looks like at that very small scale, it goes from this infinitely divisible continuum into this chaotic quantum foam. Points are just not resolvable. Once you try to resolve something, it flips and becomes something else. So here, there, now, later, are all mixed up into this cloud of possibility and uncertainty. So if we were to scale this up to the largest scales and imagine someone walking down a flight of stairs, they might appear as a jagged set of persistences, depending on how you're looking at the scene. So, Shoot first, ask later, okay? So we, we said, well, let's just hack space-time and make it quantum. But as physicists, we have to actually find, ask the question, is it true? Or is this just a game we're playing on a piece of paper? So the energies we need to probe this physics, um, to put this into context, uh, somewhere over there, like I guess seven, 10 kilometers over there is the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, it is 25 kilometers in circumference. To probe the physics that we would need to test the quantumness of geometry, we would have to build a particle sort of the size of the galaxy. So I think it's fair to say that no government is going to fund that anytime soon. So we do the next best thing, and we sift through the evidence left over from the Big Bang itself. And you're looking at it right there on that slide. It is relic radiation left over from once the universe was a very hot, dense place. So at once upon a time, the universe was such a hot place that light and matter couldn't break free. They were just sort of bouncing off of each other. But there was a moment when the universe was 378,000 years old that suddenly it cooled enough that light just broke free. And there was this flash. The universe suddenly became transparent. And that's what we're looking at. And it is a picture of a vibrating plasma. Of that, of the, and it is literally an ultrasound of the universe when it was a baby. So you don't need to look at something to understand how it sounds like. And by listening to something, you can actually tell a lot about it. So if you were to shut your eyes and someone were to play you a violin playing middle A, it would sound something like that. And you didn't need, to, need me to even tell you what that was. You could have been blindfolded and you'd recognize immediately that it was a violin because your brain took that signal and broke it down. Your audio cortex took that signal and broke it down in terms of fundamental harmonics. So the loudest note is, of course, middle A. The next loudest note is also A, octaves up. And, and so this thing is a Fourier transform. It's decomposing the sound of the violin into all of its fundamental harmonics. And from that, you can tell it's a violin. You can tell its shape. You can tell a lot about it. So if we took that vibrating plasma, and imagine we were back then when the universe was 378,000 years old and we stuck our head into that primordial goop, it would sound a bit like this. <laughs> it sounds like white noise. But again, we notice if we did the same thing that we did to the violin, there's one particular note that's quite loud, and there's a couple of harmonics, and the third harmonic is a lot louder than it should be, and that actually tells us that the universe is mostly made up of this thing called dark energy and a little bit of this thing called dark matter. And uh, if, you were to, excuse me, if you were to ask where is the evidence, so if there was any evidence that space-time would have any graininess associated with it, we would expect to see little extra ripples onto the right of this plot that we don't see to the accuracy which we measure. So therefore, this idea wasn't true. No dice, um, no, no rewards for me and my collaborators. 
So, but that's how phenomenology works, is you break the laws of physics to try and explain something that um, you think uh, might be going on, and then you, you don't care about the consequences until you prove wrong. So, we have a very simple model of the early universe. It explains everything that we've seen around us, but it begs for deeper explanation, and we don't really know what that explanation is. So it's very frustrating, it's very pleasing that we understand so much, it's also very frustrating that we can't see what is really the thing behind the Big Bang. So it could be that the underlying picture is far beyond what we've imagined, and it's a situation summed up very neatly by Niels Bohr, uh, when he quipped to a colleague that your theory is crazy, but it's not crazy enough to be true, keep trying. So um, I have nothing more to, so you know, I hope I've given you a little taste of how uh, the, the metalogic of discovery works in physics, and a little sort of like the mental hacks that we use to try and get further. And I think the thing I've learned, number one, is that there are just absolutely no rules. You are on your own. But uh, you can piggyback off of what other people have, have learned for you on your behalf. And I think the thing that I'd like to leave you with uh, that, that I think is the most important to me is that the thing that I've noticed the most about the scientists that I respect and admire the most is that they're willing to introduce noise into their process to allow them to make associations that they wouldn't have otherwise and that they have a very strong mischievous streak. They like to go on adventures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sirwad. That was fascinating. Um, how do you create noise in your universe? <laughs> uh, well, I think um, I do a lot of reading that's not related to my work. I, I, have a guitar next to my side whenever I'm doing a calculation. Uh, I always pick it up. I walk around a lot. Um, yeah, but I mean, there's other things you could do. I mean, I, I, I try to just sort of get away from, you know, hanging out with the crowd, as it were. I try not, I'm sort of allergic to the sort of, the herd, and I try to be as far away to the periphery as possible. So, so Subot and I met uh, about three years ago because he uh, was collaborating at, you know, CERN has this artist in residency program. And so he was the scientific partner of a sound artist, um, Bill Fontana, who is actually from San Francisco. And uh, yeah, we're speaking about antidisciplinarity. Do, do you think those conversations are kind of helpful also for your work or at least help you to create noise or? Oh, they're, they're amazing. I, yeah. I think uh, one of the things that uh, disappoints me about the modern world uh, is that we sort of ghettoized our brains so much in terms of these little micro communities and people rarely cross over them. And uh, you know, hanging out with someone like, like Bill, for example, was very nice because I imagined, well, maybe this is what it would have been like to have been in, in Paris in the 1920s and hanging around you know, drinking coffees in a cafe and comparing my notes of my calculations with a cubist. That's what it felt yeah. like, yeah. Yeah, and that's what we're here for today, right? <laughs> okay, thank you so Thanks much. So. <laughs> Some applause. <laughs>